if you will. Um, our next speaker is uh, someone who needs no introduction, except, you know, she's going to get introduced now anyways, whether she likes it or not. I've been working with Regina Obey for a very long time. She's one of the first people to pop up on the Postgres users list saying that she was using it for real work and full of all sorts of questions about how to make it work and how to make it better. Um, she very rapidly became a part of the community and has been really the, uh, the rock upon which Postgres has been built over the last 10 years. Um, Regina, are you, uh, are you turned on? Can we hear you? Yes, I am here. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. So it's great to hear your voice. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I said that, you know, you're one of the first, but it'd be worth it to hear. Like, tell me, tell me your Postus origin story again. Like, okay. why, did, why did you try to use this crazy brand new piece of software from Lunatics in Canada? Oh, because I didn't know you were lunatics. That's the <laughs> first thing. So I came from a database background. I was a data analyst and I was managing um, housing projects and land data. So I had no preconceptions about how spatial data should be stored. But I got excited when I found out I could store it in the database. Mm -hmm. And so that sold me. That sold you. And, uh, but post just instead of like Oracle? Mm -hmm. Well, we didn't have Oracle, we had SQL Server and luckily SQL Server did not have spatial support <laughs> at mm -hmm. the time. Yeah, I didn't get it for seven years, 2008. Okay, um, so you're gonna be talking to us today about uh, what? About post Any ex extensions. Yep. All right, so this is not about post necessarily, but the things that, uh, that are around post that make it better. Yes. Cool. Um, fire up your screen share so we can see uh, see what you're talking about. Uh, it says I can't share. Oh, oh, it's probably because I'm still sharing. My little slide is still running. Let me stop that. Okay, over to you. Okay. Can everyone see it okay? Can do. Okay. All right. So before I start, I want to mention some books that I have co-authored that are available for purchase. And two of them are on sale, 50% discount for the post just in action and 35% on PG routing if you buy directly from the publishers. And I'm also working on three new books. The first is SQL in a nutshell, fourth edition which will cover the ANSI SQL support available in Postgres and other relational databases you may have heard of, which we don't need to mention. And next, which I'm hoping we'll have out late next year is the book of PostgreSQL and also the second edition of, of PG routing, which will cover the three series. So there are lots of Postgres related extensions in the box you see to the, to the left are all the extensions that come packaged with Postgres, and I'm not going to go over them. And to the right are extensions that are shipped separately but utilize Postgres. So there's PG Routing, MobilityDB, OGR FDW, PG Point Cloud, and Oracle FDW can leverage Postgres if it's installed. So the first extension I'd like to talk about is PG Routing. And what PG routing does, what it, what it is really is a package of Postgres functions that implement graph algorithms and help you analyze graphs. And the fundamental building blocks of PG routing are edges, nodes, and costs. So as you can see here, here's an example graph. And what PG routing helps you solve are problems or constraint-based problems like navigating road networks, or even things you don't really consider as visual, which things like decision trees, which could be represented as graphs. And fairly recently is MobilityDB. And this is an extension that extends the Postgres geometry and geography types to add um, temporal information. And it also provides functions for quickly um, 
arriving at things like average speed along a path. And it also condenses the data much better, temporal data much better than Post just does. And it also has integration with QGIS, so you can view things moving in real time on your QGIS map. And one of my favorite extensions is OGR FDW, which is an abstraction on top of an extraction. It's an extraction on top of the geospatial data abstraction library, and it lets you um, query external data as if it was a table in your database, in your Postgres database. So now we talk about the Postgres extensions. I'm only going to cover the ones that define models. So Postgres models space in four key ways. There's the flat model, there's the round model, there's the matrix model, and as some people say, really everything should be modeled declaratively with the de declarative model. So the flat model treats the world, the sp uh, space, I should say, as a Cartesian grid, a flat Cartesian grid of which you can draw basic geometry types like line strings, points, polygons, or three-dimensional things like polyhedral surfaces, or use triangles to represent surfaces using uh, tints. And then there's the round model, which is the most the most the easiest to understand, but the most complex in terms of the math behind it. And it models space as a spheroid. And for Earth purposes, you usually use what's known as the WGS84 long lat. And it's what you use if you don't want to worry about spatial projections at all. And then there's the matrix model, which is what Postgres raster is. It models space as a Cartesian grid with cells that are called pixels, and you can have a number of them. So each matrix has to be exactly the same size. The pixel sizes have to be the same. And you can store a number of different um, values in them, and each matrix would, is called a band. So you can have a single raster that has elevation, so a weather, fire, so forth. And then there's the declarative model. And what the declarative model helps you do is keep track of things that are connected to each other. And when one thing changes, the other things change. And I'll demonstrate that once I get into the demo part. And so how do you install all these things? You use the Postgres, um, I mean, the Postgres create extension uh, SQL statement to install all of them. So now I'm going to switch to demos. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yep, that looks pretty good. All right, so the links here, this is the presentation, this is the code if you wanna follow along. And the, this demo was actually inspired by an extension I wrote 10 years ago that Bruce, managed, who's gonna be talking later, managed to dig up and remind me of. And so I thought, oh, this is a nice way to show, show off posters. I will show it with letters. So the first thing you do is you install the extension and it's really just a, uh, um, it has no code, it's just SQL functions, and actually only one SQL function. And so if you wanted to create a topology, you would first install Postgres topology, and ignore that, and then you would run the Postgres topology create topology function. And what this does is that it creates a schema called post just a, what, whatever you named the schema, and it initializes it with all these tables, 
which for the most part have no data except for the face one. It has a single face, which is a null geometry, which represents space that's not in your topology. And you can initialize the topology with um, data. So I'm gonna initialize it with the letters topology. And I'm gonna ignore the face that is not a face. <laughs> And you could see that even the holes in our topology are represented. So that's O and that's the hole. So yeah, so our, our area is fully covered by the topology. And then the edges are the boundaries of your faces. And if you combine everything together, you have faces, boundaries, and nodes. And note how if you have a closed edge, you have only one node. You can split edges. And if you do that, then you'll notice that we now have two nodes. And there's actually two edges here now. So the the letter T is now composed of two edges that form a closure. So the reason why you go through all this trouble is so that you could build things called topogeoms. And topogeoms are geometries that are made up of faces, edges, nodes, and other topogeometries. So to do that, you'd create a table as normal. And I'm just storing the geometry here just so we can compare, but you don't really need a geometry field. And then to add a topo column, a topo geometry column, you use this topology add topo geometry. And then you just do as you normally do, you insert your geometries into your table, except you use, if you have a post geometry, you can convert it to a topo geometry using this function, which will automatically create um, missing edges and faces in, inside the topology and then define the, the topo geometry is being composed of those. And there's an autocast function that converts a topo geometry to a geometry. But ultimately, a topo geometry is expressed as a sequence of four integers. There's the topology that it belongs to, there's the layer it belongs to, it, there's the identifier that defines it and all this data, how it relates to the topologies in the relation table. And you can pull out the elements of a, of a topo geometry using this get topo elements. And this basically has the, um, I think the ID and the type that defines, I mean, the, the elements that define it. And the way topology figures out if two topos intersect with each other is different from how geometries work. It determines intersection based on if elements of two topo geometries are shared. So it basically reduces a geometry into a bunch of integers that you then you can then compare based on the relationship. All right, so next extension is PG routing. And PG routing is somewhat similar to topology in that it uses the concept of edges and nodes to describe data, but it only cares about linear data. So there's no face involved, but it does have a cost of each edge. And so the way you, um, you, you would start off with a regular uh, network. So for example, I'm gonna form a set of roads that spell out the, letter, the letters PG routing. And the create topology in PG routing is different from the topology and the create topology in, in post topology and that it doesn't create 
a new schema. It fills in the source and target fields, which represent the node IDs in your roads table. And it uses posts just to figure out, um, to figure that out, what the start, whether the start edge, the start of an edge and the end of an edge are the same to some other um, start. And if you analyze, there's a function called PG analyze graph, and it gives you a little bit of information about your, um, your network. And it tells you right here that you have 15 ring geometries. So ring geometries are edges where the, um, the start and the end are the same, which basically means you can't do anything with them because you're, you can't, you can't navigate to your home if you're already at your home. So it just tells you um, you're already where you want to be. So there's no point in doing anything. And if you look closely, you see that there are ring edges. There's one, two, three, four. Well, if you count them all, you'll see that there's 15 of them. So that's not a very interesting network. But we can make our network a little bit more interesting by creating a, a bridge across. So now, if we run this and we analyze the graph again, we see that we are down to six ring geometry. So if we look at our new model, you see that now we can actually navigate from the letter P all the way to G because we've created a path. And another function that PG routing provides is this function called PG R connected components. And this allows you to determine which parts of your graph can be reached from other parts. So if you run this, it tells you that there's one part where all these nodes can reach each other, but all these other ones are six rings. There's only one node, so there's nothing you can do. And they're, they're all isolated. So you can't navigate with these. Um, one of the most popular functions in um, PG routing is the Dijkstra, and this allows you to um, figure out shortest path based on cost. For this, for the road network we have, I use the length as the cost, but you can use anything that you want. You could use slope, or you could use a function of speed. And so if I route... I would be going from here all the way to here. So it tells me all the nodes that I would have to traverse to get to my endpoint. Okay, so the, the first um, one of the functions packaged with PostGIS is the PostGIS raster extension, which has all the raster functions. And I'm not gonna explain what I'm doing here. I'm creating a raster from geometries that form the letter, the words happy post just there, and I'm coloring them with different colors. And the count function tells me how many pixels I have generated based on that. So I have 56,000 pixels in my raster. And there are numerous raster functions to provide stats. One of my favorite is the histogram. So this tells you how many pixels and what percent have pixel values between one and nine. You see that all our data is between one and nine or 71 and 80, 80.4. Oh, and also 142 to 131. You can also convert rasters back to geometries using this dump as polygon. And what dump as polygon gives you is a um, what's called a geom value. And a geom value is composed of a geometry and a pixel value. 
so this so each of these would be if I selected everything that's the same pixel value you'll see that gives me the different words. And then there is the pixel as polygons, which you should probably never use, um, especially for large, large rasters, but this is a fairly small raster. And it has a, a square geometry and the value for each. So it's basically um, reduces the, the pixels. It reduces, so you can see all the pixels that are formed. And Postgres Raster also uses um, uh, GDAL, which allows you to export Postgres Raster into various other raster formats. And if you use the function ST GDAL drivers, it tells you all the formats that you can read or you can export to. And it also has, so, you, so in this case, I'm using I'm converting my Postgres raster to PNG. And then I'm using um, Postgres embedded uh, encode function to make it web friendly. So if you were to paste this in, a, in the address bar of a web browser, you'd see a colorful image. And there is this function, which I almost forgot about because there's another function called ST line interpolate point, but interpolate points um, returns a multi point. And the multi point for each uh, for each line string you give it, it will give you a fractional position, it would put a point at. So in this case, every 25% um, along the edge, I would get a point. So all my edges have four points. And then there's my favorite subdivide just because it looks cool, but it's also useful for improving um, intersection and, and other spatial operations. It divides your um, geometry into pieces. And then there's the generate points, which is also pretty cool. And it populates your geometry with points. So if I give it 100, I get 100 points. Give it a 1,100, I get 1,100 points. And then there's what I call bread and butter function, which is the buffer which just buffers whatever geometry you give it. And I'm gonna go through these very quickly because I'm gonna run out of time. So that's boundary. This is centroid, centroid. Envelope. Bounding diagonal. An oriented envelope is a very useful function if you're doing parcel analysis because it gives you a very simplified version of what your parcel would look like. So unlike the envelope, which is always um, axis aligned, the oriented envelope is not. And then minimum. And this one was one that Paul showed already. And the ma maximum inscribed circle is a weird one because it returns three geometries. I'm going to overlay them all together. But the first geometry it returns is the center. And then the nearest point on the geometry. And then if you combine them all together, you get this. So the center, if you buffer it by the radius, you end up with that. And then start point, point on surface, point on surface there. Um, 
ST diluted triangles, which creates a whole bunch of triangles. The a fairly recent function, the hexagon grid, which should be obvious what it does. And its companion square grid. Convex hull, concave hull, and reduced position, uh, precision, which requires uh, GEOS 3.9. So let's just go through this. So if you do 10, you go down to, you see how it becomes pixelated. And split, I'm not going to show, I don't think. Yeah, that's kind of hard to see what that's doing. So offset curve is, us is useful for if you're doing road analysis. And it creates a curve. So if you give it a positive value, the curve is outside. And if you give it a negative, oh, actually, no, I have this backward. So that's a negative inside positive outside. And longest line we already saw. Translate. Okay, I think I've run out of time. So I, now I'm gonna take questions. All right, um, well, that, that was really cool. Um, I love the letters. <laughs> the letters is the, the basis to hang off all the, uh, all the functions. It's so much nicer and more visceral than, uh, than like you know, a parcel layer or something like that. So, uh, so yeah, we've got a um, question from Matt Schmidt. Um, I've been using SD concave hull on a point cloud in PostGIS 3.1.3, but got quite inaccurate results despite using a relatively low target value. Um, doing the same in QGIS, uh, using the concave hull function in a setting of 0.1 yields much better results. What's the reason for this? Do you have a recommendation on this? Maybe it's already been improved in a newer PostGIS version. Um, what do you say, Regina? Talk it out, we'll type it in after. I created SD concave hole a long time ago and I haven't yeah. touched it since. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the answer is it's old and crufty. Uh, my, uh, my colleague here at the Geospatial Center of Excellence, Martin Davis, um, has, I think, had on his list of, of things he wanted to improve the concave hall algorithm for a very long time, but has been holding off um, the difficulty with improving functions like that, which are popular. Um, is that the improvement is always different from what the original was. Um, and there is inevitably some percentage of the user base for whom the improvement is perceived as not an improvement, but actually, a, but actually a, an unimprovement. And uh, so there's always somebody unhappy with a new and improved version. So, so yeah, maybe we'll have a different uh, concave hall at a minimum, um, a native implementation, something in GS and JTS would get a lot of use and it would probably be faster but it would provide different results. Um, maybe sometimes better results as the questioner uh, points out, but maybe sometimes results which people don't like because they're different. Change is hard. Um, you did not uh, cover PG Point Cloud. Why was that, Regina? Uh, it's hard to cover things in 25 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> as you've shown, as you've shown. Um, or uh, or mobility DB, like what would a mobility DB demo? Yeah, like? if I had an hour, I would have covered those, but yeah, uh, 25 yeah. minutes I can't cover. So the, the moral of the story is give Regina a larger block. We'll remember that for next time. And you should remember next time to say, hey, I deserve a larger block, because you do. Um, another question on the q and is, uh, can you point us to some better resources to know about PG routing and other PostGIS extensions?
Um, can I point you at some better resources? I mean, I think right now the best the best is uh, the PG routing documentation and the posters documentation and my book. <laughs> oh. And my other book that's coming, <laughs> the PG routing uh, second edition will cover, because the first edition covered all the two series stuff. The third edition, Vicky has added a ton of functions. Um, so that will be covered in the second edition of PG Rounding. Yeah. So yeah, the books is well worth putting your money down for a book. Uh, the uh, online documentation is fine. The online workshops are fine, but there's something about, you know, the proper treatment in a book and then the fact that you can page through it in ways you can't online. So, uh, so yeah, put down your money for a PG Rounding book or for a, for a post this book. Um, <laughs> can we see your face? Uh, there are other videos of Regina online. If you type in Regina Obey Postis, you'll find a few things that have been recorded at various conferences. Um, great talks. And uh, if you want to email, I would suggest not emailing any one person um, ever. Uh, if you're trying to get in touch with the community, unless you actually literally want something that only they can do. Um, you'll have seen in the slideshow that we've been putting in the breaks that uh, that uh, the, the users list is the one, number one best place to get help about anything and everything because there's 2,000 people on the users list. There's someone who knows the answer, and it's not always me. It's not always Regina. Okay, so the PG admin question: Someone mm -hmm. asked, "How do you get to the narrow?" Um, I think there's a setting here because something happened in 4.0. There's a there's a setting. which I can't remember where it is. Hmm. Um, actually, I think they fixed it. If you just upgrade to PG admin 6.2, you probably don't even need to touch the setting, but it's this setting, this maximum column width. All right. Um, Regina, can you hang out and uh, answer a few more questions in the chat and in the Q&A? Uh, we're gonna move on now to Reese Stewart.